So this may be on your mind as recent articles are being published that there may be a stock market crash, there may be a hard landing, as bank earnings didn't come out super, super well. They came out pretty darn good. However, some of the banks did show that increased delinquencies and things are not necessarily heading all in the one direction. It's a split between all of them. Today, we're gonna to be talking about exactly where the market is going, how we're continuing to be bullish. However, there are signs of weakening in the markets and subsequently how we can profit off these opportunities if we go up, if we go down and what the general sentiment of the market's gonna be and how the dynamic is actually shifting right Right now to possibly leading to further downside potential, but also profit opportunities along the way. As we all know, the fear and greed index, which is a wonderful, wonderful indicator of sentiment, has been showing that we've been in staying in extreme greed to greed territory. Warren Buffett has told us that we should be fearful when this is happening, and he's doing exactly what he said. He's actually not really doing much in the markets. He's selling a lot of things, and I would not be surprised if he sells off Bank of America in Berkshire Hathaway's latest earnings report, which is two weeks away. This week, we don't really got a lot on deck. We have a bunch of earnings, right? It's the start of earnings season, but we really haven't seen the big kickoff, right? We get Tesla this week, which is a big news catalyst event. They're expected to report a meager earnings, right? It's kind of a split either way. We'll explore Tesla's earnings in this video of what the expectations are and how we could be playing it later in the video. But also we're gonna mainly talk about the S&P and the NASDAQ, the levels that we gave out, the Netflix play that we gave out profited beautifully, right? Easily $200 that you could have made for five minutes of work. So if you guys missed that one, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel so we come out with a Tesla video of how we're gonna profit. We're gonna probably play Tesla the exact same way because IV is gonna be cranked up to no end. It's gonna be very, very easy. If you're not familiar with options, I walk you through it in that video, exactly how to place a trade, why we're placing the trade, how to structure it, all that, so you know exactly what needs to happen. And we give out these weekend deep dive videos where we go over the levels for the market if you knew that we should have been bullish the entire way during this week in the market well you would have known that if you watched the video we gave out the levels that we had to look at and subsequently it was a banger week right going back to earnings we got tesla we also got verizon on deck boeing's mixed in american airlines so we're going to be looking at some of these as greater profit opportunities we'll be going over the plays during the live streams on tuesdays and thursdays 7 p.m eastern so make sure you guys check that one out 3M is one of those bigger ones, RT, uh, TX, which is um, Raytheon, and subsequently Enphase, right? We're going to be talking about a bunch of these, so make sure you guys stay tuned there. UPS is one that I'm going to be looking out for just because they have pretty good movement on earnings and good liquidity. We're mainly going to focus on the ones that have high liquidity. And some more bad news, right? U.S. vacancy homes and counting, 5.6 million homes are vacant. And their question is, is there a housing market crash brewing, right? We saw some of the data come in this week, which wasn't too spectacular with building permits and home starts, right? A lower than consensus number, but that doesn't necessarily mean like everyone's jumping at the bits to get to this housing market crash, right? Like if we just look at the Redfin home price index, and I've been beating this dead horse for quite some time. If you look back at September last year, we were at approximately 412, we're at 428. We're still higher than we were previously. So there's no data indicating that the housing market is shrinking. There's no indication that there is panic yet, right? In order to have a housing crash, as a lot of people say, I define that as basically more than 30% decrease in home prices. This number right here is going to have to actually go negative. If it does not go negative, we're not getting a housing crash. So all the fear porn that could be out there of this 5 point million vacancies, yes, we are seeing a larger amount of homes staying on the market, staying on for longer, and we really haven't seen markets adjust for applications, right? We saw rate cuts, we saw the expectation rate cuts, but there's no one really with money left to buy as the consumer is essentially done. And that's why we talk about on this channel, the balance of risks between, is there gonna be a housing crash? Is there not gonna be a housing crash? Stock market crash, not stock market crash. I talk about this incessantly, which is the um, yield curve, which is showing that we're still in an uninverted territory. For all those that don't know what the yield curve is, it's basically been the grim reaper of every single recession slash depression, has basically a 90% accuracy. When it uninverts, where the longer dated, higher risk yields, or bonds, I'm lending you money for a longer period of time, 
are demanding less money than the shorter term, right? So everyone's basically being fearful on the short term, not necessarily on the long term. And when it uninverts is when reality starts to kind of snap back in. We still remain uh, uh, uninverted for the time being. This happened in 2008, 2000, 1929, right? All the subsequent big kahuna crashes, this has hallmarked it. And traditionally, when our uninversion in August it's 12 to 24 months. So we're looking at Q3 of next year when the official recession is announced, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not in one right now. We're starting to see more and more carnage. And the question is, as the battleground states polling heats up, does this mean that we're gonna start getting real numbers? We've seen that a lot of these crime statistics are getting revised positively. And the, the sentiment is shifting to kind of, let's talk about the reality of the situation. On top of, we saw a large amount of outflows from banks and the reverse repo is actually going back to the lowest lows had in over five years, which is basically saying that all is not well in the bond market. And subsequently, does that mean it's gonna trickle over to the stock market? So going back to the stock market, right? We talked about the levels. Let's recap the S&P real quick, and then I'll give you guys the new levels for this week. Simply put it, S&P weekly a higher high, closing near the all-time highs, and NASDAQ is where it gets interesting. I said NASDAQ was interesting last week, and this week it was again another point of contention. We did not close above the weekly previous week's higher high. We made two subsequent weekly, or actually three subsequent weekly higher highs, but failed to hold it. Tech wasn't necessarily excited, especially with Netflix bombing or sorry banking earnings like no tomorrow just bombing it out of nowhere actually going outside the expected move which pushed it higher up to 763 now the question is is Netflix going to get to that thousand dollar mark in the subsequent next six months to then get that 10 to 1 split that a lot of these companies are doing especially with companies like Nvidia right just pushing higher and higher kind of tackling that all-time high but hitting some resistance but we're gonna dive into all this in just a moment for the S&P and the NASDAQ. We'll come back to some of the bigger cap stocks to know what exactly is going on with them. And yeah, we're gonna first clean up the chart for you guys and go over exactly what the levels we have to pay attention to. So we know exactly like this week where we need to be bull side, bear side, and even give you some trading ideas. So the S&P and NASDAQ actually are giving you easier trading weeks than the previous week because the range is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And also the basically profit loss markers are getting even more advantageous for you. What do I mean by that? You don't really have to move a lot in the market to necessarily know if you're gonna be wrong or right. The trade pretty much tells you if you're gonna be right or you're gonna be wrong, and there's different avenues you can take to take advantage of it. So simply starting off with S&P, we can clearly see we're very close to the weekly higher high, especially with the NASDAQ. And we'll talk about why the NASDAQ is so interconnected with the S&P that the weekly higher high is a very, very high probability trade. So we're gonna be looking to accumulate anywhere down to 580 and 33. Anywhere up below, from where we are now to below that would be an indication of accumulation, right? The nine day moving average would be our secondary support. We don't necessarily go bullish, or sorry, we don't necessarily go bearish until 758.54. If we do, then subsequently, that is where we say, okay, there's a lot of things that broke. We're bef uh, below the previous week's higher high. We're below the weekly low. We're below the nine day moving average. Okay, there, there's something going wrong. And also if we get a slam down to that level but and close, right? You wanna look at for the closing price. That'll be an indication of more pain ahead. There's also the possibility that we just kind of go stagnate. So if we come down to this lower quadrant right here, then some uh, we can basically be selling puts or selling spreads on the down to the upside potential basically to take advantage of that theta decay so when it rips up it'd be an area of accumulation i wouldn't necessarily do anything from 582 all the way to 586 why is that subsequently i want the discounted price for this region right here and i don't want to necessarily put a lot of risk on the table to then get more downside potential this area right here from that 582 to 586 is more of a wait and see right because if you get the weekly break then you know okay be bullish you know a line in the sand to basically close your position if you come back below 586 on a closing basis then you close your position and wait for a new opportunity right you may take a small loss even if we push again back up you can reinitiate the trade and basically becomes a wash but you know you're not riding it all the way down to 578. you can do this with stocks right you could accumulate below 582 all the way to 580 could be an accumulation area and subsequently where that nine day moving average that'd be an extremely discounted point of buying now 
if we break 578.54, the Nasdaq's gonna be breaking down as well. And then I'd be looking at these peaks right here around the 574 as a first target for bearish plays, but I won't be necessarily discussing the bearish plays because there's no evidence right now on the chart for them. We have a continuous uptrend. We really don't have that 574 in play and even 565, right? Well, if we get the weekly breakdown, I will make a video for you guys. So make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and updating you of what those plays could be, how we're gonna be selling calls, which side do we wanna be on, debit side transaction, uh, credit side transaction. We'll be going over the VIX in just a moment to kind of know where the sentiment is for options. Personally, I still believe that VIX is coming down to that $12, $15 uh, price point, currently sitting at 18. So it still benefits us to be sell side option the market versus buy side the market. Now, jumping over the NASDAQ, we can clearly see that there is another profit opportunity. And this is where the NASDAQ is going to really be our temperature gauge, right? The S&P is in an area where we're not necessarily sure, but it can be the NASDAQ be the trigger for that temperature gauge. If we break above 494.47, that would indicate a bullish rotation on the NASDAQ. And I really wanna get above that 496 point because subsequently that is where we struggled previously. Get above that, start making way to 498. That's where I would initiate those bullish positions preemptively. And also the S&P most likely would be breaking out at that point. Now, if we're failing to hold 494.47, then I'm basically gonna be like, okay, from here to here, is where I just wanna sit on my hands. The S&P may come into an interesting value proposition then, but the NASDAQ is gonna be threatening a weekly breakdown, right? There's not a lot of support there. We've spent a lot of price accumulation here. And as we stay in that area, yes, we're accumulating more, but really we need to break out, right? We had two failed breakouts right here. And subsequently that is concerning for the broader market. Can the move movement sustain itself in the markets? And if it can't, what is the result? We really don't have any big earnings to catalyze us to the upside. We have Tesla earnings, but like we showed, it's not really a big player this week. Subsequently, we see 494.47 being that rotationary point. Above that on the NASDAQ, that's when you start initiating those bullish plays, selling puts, buying debit transactions if you wanna risk some of that debit depreciation uh, from a contraction of IV. That's why I say I don't necessarily want to be buy side on the options. You could do regular stock on the NASDAQ, right? The break above 494.47, you could initiate positions, dollar cost average up to 498.83, and then put your bigger position on that weekly break. Remember, the NASDAQ actually hasn't made a new all time high, whereas the SP has been churning up. So tech has been lagging. And subsequently, that is the point of concern that we are going to see a lagging tech sector that's not really enthusiastic about everything as we head in, right? Bitcoin was one of those bigger cap things that was happening this week. And we can jump over to real quick and then we'll go into some of these like bigger cap stocks. Bitcoin did have a strong close on Friday, but I really want to see that $70,000 mark get broken. Why is that? It's the previous resistance point that we encountered the last time we broke out of the wedge, right? Failed breakout back here and then slammed back down below. So above 70 would be a very bullish indication of the markets because that mean, okay, Bitcoin is holding is not a failed, uh, failed breakout again, right? This thing has faked so many people out recently and that would be give the riskiest assets that sentiment of bullishness. It would coincide also with the fear and greed index sitting at 75, which would be bullish for markets. So again, going back to Bitcoin, this is where your sentiment is starting to turn into a bullish, but it's showing weakness, right? We also see weakness in stocks like Microsoft, right? Just hammering that 15,200, just squeezing between the two, threatening a deck cross, not threatening a deck cross, golden cross. Like it's just Microsoft right now is in a hosh and it's one of the bigger cap stocks. If we look at Apple, right, pushing to new all-time highs, but again, if Apple's leading and the rest of the market's struggling, that is cause for concern. We got Amazon kind of not really knowing what it wants to do. So some of these bigger cap stocks are going into no man's land, as I call it, for their earnings with Google as well, right? So we're seeing a similar pattern, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, not really leading that strength. People are not necessarily wanting to buy. They're not enthusiastic about these stocks. They're looking for big, better discounts in small caps, but that could be very, very uh, bad for the markets because subsequently it's not driving that catalyst that has been driving that. Again, a lot of money has been concentrated in these bigger cap stocks. And as we see here, Meta threatening possibly a downturn to that 50 day moving average, looking at possibly a nice 5% pullback in it. Again, bigger cap stock like this 
going into their earnings being bearish, right? This could be an interesting play if Meta pushes down like Netflix and then has a reversal. Definitely be looking to buy because Meta's had an extremely bullish earnings run. So subsequently, let's jump into VIX and then we'll conclude with Fatal's biggest winners and losers before the debate. VIX has pushed down to an interesting point. It's coming down to this 50, parking itself there. And subsequently, if we get bullish appreciation in the markets or any depreciation in VIX, I'd be definitely looking to buy up at that $15 mark. That's where I'd probably be looking to price in some bullish uh, VIX calls, right? That's where I was previously pricing in around 12, 13. I definitely be looking at 15 because it's been an interesting base, right? One big base before the election as volatility contracts to then expand subsequently in the next preceding weeks. That'll be an interesting point for contention. I'll also update you guys of that play as we head into earnings. So again, we're going to go over the biggest winners and losers and then Fatal's going to give you that and we'll be back for the debate section of the video. With the election on its way, we can see that the S&P 500 is still going up, however, not at the same rate, only going 0.45% in the past five days, and on the one day as of Friday, it only went up 0.4%. Looking at the next upcoming earnings, we can see that this week, it is absolutely bonkers. On Monday, we have companies like SAP and Logitech. On Tuesday, we got Verizon, GM, 3M. RTX, we got over here GE Aerospace, which that was going to be an interesting one. That was with the whole uh, GE split, right? Enphase, we also got Baker Hughes, Texas Instrument, and a lot more. On Wednesday, we got none other than Tesla, which is going to be a really fun one, as well as Boeing, AT&T, Coca-Cola, Next Era Energy, Newmont, Thermo Fisher, and a lot more. Thursday, we got American Airlines, UPS, Southwest, NASDAQ, and Tractor Supply. And guys, UMP, which is a company that I really do like, We'll see how that one goes, as well as Texas Roadhouse 2. Another one I'm really am looking forward to see their earnings. And on Friday, we got New York Community Bank Corp, Colgate, and honestly, that's about it. Oh, I'm sorry, Booz Allen Hamilton, which should be a really interesting one as well. Looking at now into the heat map, we can see that we do have a lot of green overall, but there are pockets of red, starting, of course, with the technology sector. The worst performer here seems to be none other than the company KLA Corp, losing 15.58%, and the best performer it is none other than Dayforce Inc. gaining 4.89%. Into another communications sector. A lot of green here as well. Actually, there were, I'm pretty certain that all of these are essentially in the green, all except for just a few. And the worst performer was none other than Meta, losing 2.28%. And the best performer, it is the company Netflix, gaining 5.69%. The consumer cyclicals is really, really interesting. All of these, if not most, are in massively in the green. Worst performer is the company Win Resorts losing 5.07%. And the best performer, it is none other than the company Polte Group, or what is it? Yeah, Polte Group Inc. gaining 7.07% on the week. And looking at the consumer defensive, there's a lot of green here as well, guys. We got the worst performer being none other than the company Bungie Global losing 7.65%. And the best performer seems to be this right there, Lamb Western Holdings gaining 9.63%. And now that we got the big major banks out of the way, you guys can see that the financials are actually doing very well. Yeah, honestly... Fairly surprising to see that city still in the red as opposed to all the other ones in the banks diversified. All in all, though, the worst performer, it is the company Erie, what right here, Erie Identity, I don't even know what this is, losing 9.92%. And the best performer in the whole entire sector, it is none other than the company Blackstone Inc. gaining 12.62%. In the healthcare sector, a lot of red here. This is the second reddest one that we have seen and as opposed to like the tech sector. We got the worst performer being the company, wow, Elevance Health losing 14.17%. But you guys can see that all of the healthcare plans once fell, including UNH. UNH is at $569.61. Still, though, really good opportunity to buy this company. Just check their fundamentals, guys. They are absolutely incredible, incredible fundamentals. And the best performer in the whole entire sector, it is none other than, let's see over here, see if I can find it. Seems to be the company, 
Ironically enough, uh, you guys can't see it, but that is Walgreens gaining 17.16%. Sorry that I don't have this so that way you guys can see it, but they did gain 17.16%. Into now the industrials, a lot of green here. We can see that the worst performer, it is the company, none other than, uh, yeah, Copart losing 3.65% and the best performer it is none other than the company United Airlines gaining 19.98%. Looking into another real estate sector, all of these are in the, wow, there isn't a single one here that is in the negative. That's actually fairly surprising. All of these are in the green, guys. So yeah, I mean, let's take a look at realty income right now, guys. 60 four dollars and 71 cents again you did have the opportunity to buy this company sub 50 bucks just a few months ago and then for a while right they've been sub 60 for quite some time and right now they're upwards of 64 dollars so shout out to any of you who bought a lot when they fell sub 50 or even sub 60 we can see here though in this sector the not the worst performer but i guess just the one that was less green was the company wirehauser only gaining 0.09 percent basically flat and the best performer it is none other than seems to be guys uh oh wow okay so it is definitely yeah it's definitely the company bxp as you guys can see right here bxp gaining 8.13 percent but you got wall tower gaining 5.64 you got sbac gaining 5.98 so you had a lot a lot of green in general when it came to this sector and speaking of green, it continues over here in the utilities. Wow, all of these are in the green, all except for one, and that's NRG, losing 3.81%, the worst performer, and the best performer, it is none other than the company, Dominion Energy, gaining 6.58% on the week. Now, from green, two consecutive greens, and now ruby red, we got the energy sector falling a lot. We got the worst performer being none other than the company, Halliburton losing 8.08% and the best performer, it is Williams Co gaining 3.72%. And lastly, the basic materials, the worst performer here, it is Albemarle losing 6.74% and the best performer, it is Newmont, which they do have earnings this week, gaining 6.11%. So all in all, when it comes to this week, it's going to be interesting when it comes to earnings, but aside from that, not really sure if there's anything else, which I don't necessarily think so. I think we're all just waiting for the election. So with that said, guys, Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and take it away, Mike. So I figure we start off with going through what the weeks have in store for us. Obviously earnings, right? We all know earnings. But I want to go through the news, really. And there's not a lot. Uh, we got bill auction on Monday. Not really much. We got Fed speakers speaking kind of through this period, right? Because again, their blackout period's coming up for their meeting. So it's coming right around this week, I believe, is their blackout period where they can't talk anymore. So hopefully mm -hmm. we won't hear any more um, BS from these Fed speakers as everything's hunky-dory. Uh, and that got... blackout, hang on a minute, and that blackout period is because of the FOMC, right? Yes, on the okay. 7th. So Seventh. they're... Yep. It actually officially will start Friday, right? So after these earnings on this week, Friday officially starts the blackout period. So next week, we'll have peace and quiet from all these Fed members that are just coming out and job owning to us all a day long. Uh, we'll get some more housing data, some S&P Global manufacturing data on Thursday, right? That could be a little bit of a catalyst day. However, we're going to have Tesla earnings the prior day from that. So kind of going to be Pick your poison of which one's going to be the one that drives the market. I personally think it's going to be Tesla earnings <laughs> and then some durable good orders coming out on Friday. Nothing too crazy. Uh, net speculative positions actually uh, in the positive, which if you remember the last time we were here, the market didn't like it, right? The market was like, oh, there's no more bears to steal money from. Bulls, come on, your turn. Come on, it's your, it's, it's your turn. <laughs> yeah. And if you yeah. look at the price action on the market, right, as we went over, it's not looking like the hottest thing in the universe. It's kind of just meh, right? Not really um, being that strong price action that we saw. And the question actually becomes, are we gonna start going sideways? We're we gonna start going down, right? Like what was the catalyst gonna be? Um, I, as you said, earnings. Yeah. I think it's just going to be earnings. I think, I honestly believe that even with PCE, even with all these earnings, I think I, I, I me, me personally, right? Me personally, mm -hmm. I think the one thing that investors are just waiting for the biggest event of the year. The uh, election, obviously. The election. Yeah. That That's it. Because the election is like, we're, we're close enough now, which I think we're like, Two weeks now? Maybe you're like two weeks and a few? You're 16 days. So you're two weeks right. and two days. So two weeks and a few. Um, 
people are just waiting for that because whoever gets elected is going to determine so much about how the economy is going to go down. Yeah. Right? Which is getting elected. Which is funny, you know, they started pushing against Virginia laws. I'm like, yes. So I'm like, okay, wait, wait, wait. So this isn't bad enough, right? This, this is not bad enough for you. Now you're worried about Virginia. So either you're predicting a slaughter to the point where you're, you're just grasping at straws. And who thought like in your state, Pennsylvania would be almost a point, right? Like, well, it's crazy. Sure, but what I have to say to that is do not get complacent. Yeah. Please do not get complacent, especially if you're in a swing state. Like, well, if, even if you're not in a swing state, don't get, get, don't get complacent. But specifically, if you're in a swing state like Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, for the love of all that is good, please, please, please do not get complacent. Please do not get complacent. Okay. If you think that you're up 2%, think that you're down 20%, right? This Go is the way that vote. I look at it. Go out Sun Tzu. And vote. Sun Tzu, never underestimate your enemy. Never. Right. Never. Now, one of the things that um, was underestimated, right, is um, how much the Middle East tensions are going to heat up, right? Because we did have that the um, drone was launched at Netanyahu's uh, residence that actually mm -hmm. bombed his residence. He wasn't there, right? So uh, he, he obviously... Wait, wait, wait. wait. What happened here? Because so I wasn't aware of that. They, Hez Hezbollah launched a drone at Netanyahu's house and bombed the wow. crap out of it. So Netanyahu wow. is basic, and there's leaks also that just recently came out that uh, Israel plans to st strike Iran directly. They're making all their plans right now to strike them. So obviously this is going to heat up as we're heading into the election season. So it's like, how much can the markets ignore the, the volatility that is heading our way? And Dude. subsequently, it's like, right, like if we look at VIX, like I mentioned before, if I showed you VIX and then I showed you the market, you would be telling me like, no, everything's fine, right? Every, everything's fine. Because this thing is just cranking down to like nothing, right? It's just sitting right here at 18 being like, oh, hunky dory, nothing bad is going to happen. And I'm like, it's like the Iranian meme that we showed a couple weeks ago. I'm threatening World War Three over here and the best you can do is 20? Yeah. So apparently the best the VIX can do is 19 or 18 or 15 at this point. Yeah, no, I, I honestly, at this point of the game, I think we're literally just waiting. Again, I, I think I, I guys, I, I honestly believe this. I honestly believe this. If Donald Trump wins, get ready for the biggest crash across the board, across everything. Wouldn't it be I funny? I pray that that's not the case. Hang on a minute. I pray that that's not the case. Right, but it's it's just it's the the, the domino, and, and I could be wrong, right? And I 100% could be wrong on this. I have been wrong about a lot of stuff. I thought that you know that the spigot of inflation in comparison to um, to the interest rates was eventually going to stall out. It didn't, right? I can admit when, when I'm wrong on, on that kind of stuff, but it just seems that the dominoes are being placed so perfectly that no matter who, like who if she, if she wins then they'll keep kicking the can down the road the fed will continue to cut rates right by 50 50 maybe even 75 um or bigger uh to get those interest rates back to back, back, or close to zero percent or they could easily they could easily just do the opposite if trump were to win and then say and then by like q2 of next year maybe even q3 of next year be like it's his fault yeah or they could also like start reporting the real numbers. And wouldn't that it be too. surprising that like, if we look at oil, right? We can see the economy is not well, right? We have the health of the economy, the economy is not well. So you're heading towards bringing that 66, $65 on crude, which has traditionally been the temperature gauge for the economy. But what if you get Trump's victory and then, oh, we uh, miscalculated CPI. Here's the revision of the actual inflation numbers, right? Like, just like with the crime? Just like with the whole crime, yeah, crime who, stats? Yeah, right. Who, who, um, I would not put it past them. Let's put it that way. I would not put it past them to be like, oh, we screwed up the inflation numbers. Here's the real inflation. And the Fed has to do a 100 basis point hike, right? To just, just cr like prime crush the economy before even Trump gets in. Just like with the um, with the with the jobs, remember that job revisions of like almost eight hundred thousand, or yeah, I think it was a, a little bit more than eight hundred thousand. Just round it up to a million. Right? It's really a dang million. Like right, like they said eight hundred thousand. I'm like okay, and then you revised it subsequently even more afterwards. It's a dang million at this point. I agree. 
I agree. So, or or they could easily just move the reference point because right now, right now, all the headline news are like the uh, uh, you know inflation's coming down, inflation's coming down, right? Based off of twenty twenty two. Yeah. So they could easily just put the reference point in like 2018 and then be like, oh, see, inflation is actually a lot higher. Well, you know, they actually, when they did their, cal when they changed the calculation in 2023, they changed it to only take the last year versus the, previously was the last two years compounded. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like they, they fudge the number all the time. They, they, they're they going to fudge the number. But the question is, right, like for crude showing this, we got Bank of America and various other um, banks talking about 3,000 gold by 2025, right? So 3,000 wow. gold, that's not a far stretch for gold, especially with like when you're talking about like a hyperinflation economy. But mm -hmm. my question is about the... Um, the news right of china right we got the gdp numbers they came out slowly better uh, for china's gdp on thursday night going into friday and subsequently we got a nice big rally in china's market how fast to the bottom do you think this is going to go if trump wins like is it just going to be like a line here and then a like well just like you know l l let's just put a line like right down here right like just gap for that, for that, we would have to we would have to take a look at 2018 around March when the tariffs started to happen with China, oh, right? Actually, that will give you that will give you a sense as to what's about to happen, right? So let's you, see. 20... You use the past to determine the future. So <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna let you guess where 2018 uh, started. I, mean, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. What China did? What? Uh, 2018 to 2019 was 25 percent. So yeah. 25% from where we are now. Yeah, about there, right? About about yeah. exactly where I was saying, uh, form a new bottom. And this, like with China, right? This awfully looks like a um, classical bear flag pattern here where we have- Oh yeah, I see it, I see it. Yeah, yeah right there and then right there. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It, it. it'd be funny with the catalyst being Trump uh, throwing, a, what was it? 500% tariffs or something that he recently said in an interview. So, well, he said that he said that about John Deere. At least that's what I remember. But. Well, regardless, he he said a very interesting in, in uh, Martha Raddatz interview where he was like, "It doesn't matter what percentage, it's to get them to the table." And he literally right. told him point blank of like this, like you threaten it to get them to the table. You don't. Right. Do, uh, so I'm like, start classical, it's a classical businessman. But so. but but just that threat alone will spook the markets. Oh yeah, and so. uh, we got to give a health check to the revert uh, to the uh, uh, yield curve. Obviously, not uh, doing loop de loops like some would say. Uh, so you know, just argue. I would argue unless once you start getting in further in. Then yeah, yeah, but yeah, it, you, could, uh, it could start consolidating right there, my guy. It could just start consolidating right there. No, no, no. no. We're saying. we're we're on this phase, right, where we fake everyone out like we did here, and then next comes oh, okay. the the fun drop. I I do not want right. to see this. I <laughs> under right. under no circumstances do I want to see that positive number again. We shall see. We shall see on uh, that. Give me PTSD oh. of the loop de loops back here when you said, ah, oh, it's <laughs> gonna do loop de loops, and it's like na 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 na. Yeah. I'm like, I, yep. that was months of torture. I wasn't, I, I was right on that one though. But how did the markets end uh, this week when it came to the fear and greed? Ah, you, got, you gotta love the good old fear and greed index. Uh, actually, extreme greed. We're playing loop-de-loops -loops with the extreme greed, good sir. Not surprising. I think, I'd love to see, is, is there a way that we can like see uh, on the year to date for this fear and greed? Because I would love to see how like much. That? So okay, basically, I, well, what I wanted to see was is how much of the time, what percentage of the time did the sphere and greed index land or stay in the greed slash extreme greed category well, for, this, can, for um, this year, like 75% of the time? Yeah, well, 50 is the neutral territory. So you could actually for the year, it's about 50-50, right? You were because like from April to about, well, uh, I I would say yeah you you kind of like a fifty fifty split because in April to July it was neutral kind of like touching each side so it kind of stayed a good, I would say like a thirty five thirty five thirty five split because mm -hmm. you're you stayed in neutral for quite some time right we during this period I of April that. to July we were just like bouncing between the two and it was like okay wait this thing broken right and now we've had that. spits of like January of twenty twenty four to basically April was greed and extreme like the the indicator was broken completely yeah and for yeah. a period of time now we could see the same thing because we traditionally go into this seasonality of the market of being bullish into november october december right that's santa traditional claus rallies, santa claus yep. rally right 
But I keep going back to how much of a damper can this put on it uh, for if things shift dramatically in two weeks. Right. And it really is going to be interesting to see how markets react with that, right? How futures react with that, which we are going to be the live streaming guys on that day uh, for a long time, for a long time. In fact, in fact, um, 100%, I'm taking off the sixth so that way I I could stream all throughout the fifth, like the fifth night. But because the FOMC is on the seventh, I may actually end up taking off the seventh as well, just so that way we could cover the FOMC live um, as well. But... Pat, I'm not about Pat that one. comes out and be like, uh, we, uh, we, we're we not going to cut rates uh, today. Oh, dude, you know the questions. You know the questens. Whatever oh, happens they're going to be sixth, spicy. They're going to be spicy. Yep. Yep. The Mr. Are Bloomberg gonna be is going to be awesome, probably. Yep. Yep. So we'll see how that ends up going. And no, for, for a fact that we'll take off on the 6th, so that way we can live stream all the way on the 5th. I don't know about the 7th, but we'll see on that one. And uh, I think that's about it, right, Mike? Yeah, they're, uh, we're closed today, guys. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend, wonderful trading week. Uh, again, earnings this week. Uh, you got Verizon, 3M, Tesla, Vert, uh, yeah. Vertiv, um, which is like the mini NVIDIA. That's another one that we got to keep an eye on. Uh, American which Airlines, one? UPS. Which one? The one next to Tesla, Vertiv. Vertiv, I've never heard yeah. of that one before. They're, um, they build the infrastructure for AI. So okay. as to NVIDIA is like kind of like the AI chips, they're the infrastructure. So okay. uh, AT&T, Coca-Cola. So it's going to be a fantastic time. We'll probably stream, what, Tuesday and Thursday or uh, do like a Tuesday, Wednesday split. I don't know yet. I, I had the idea that we were going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We'll see because I have obligations and work one of these days. So we have to okay. see. Or two days. Right, I don't know. No problem. I'll see. No problem. We'll, we'll keep the, the schedule tentative for now, but we're definitely two live streams probably this week. And thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And we got the video queued up over here uh, for one of our latest videos. Make sure you guys check that one out. Thank you all so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.